Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Nancy Jo Lambert uh, for the ISTE Librarians Network and your host for tonight's webinar. Thanks so much for joining our Modern Research and Writing. Hello and welcome. I'm Nancy Jo Lambert uh, for the ISTE Librarians Network and your host. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks so much for joining our Modern Research and Writing webinar with Victor. Karkar from Scribble, the ISTE Librarians Network, is proud to be hosting this free webinar with Victor and Scribble. Uh, Scribble is a Google for Education partner that's built an advanced research and writing platform for students and educators. The ISTE Librarians Network has a mission to promote librarians as leaders and champions of educational technology and digital literacy. Our key mission is to provide a professional learning community where librarians can leverage technology, knowledge, and expertise to improve school library programs, increase access to information, and foster strong teaching and learning environments in a connected world. Tonight's webinar, Modern Research and Writing, will highlight ways to use Scribble to support students and teachers with the research and writing process. Victor and Scribble, our presenter, will introduce and demo Scribble for you. I'll also describe how I'm using Scribble at Reedy High School in Frisco, Texas. And we'll, heal, and we'll hear how leading librarian Kathy Schmidt uses Scribble at Coleman Middle School in Duluth, Georgia. Victor is the co-founder and CEO of Scribble, which he started with personal passion to address his own frustration working with online information in graduate school. He's grown and led Scribble since it was just an idea in his head. He scribbles chief evangelist, product designer, and business lead. He's presented widely at many library and ed tech events that I personally have been to and seen <laughs> to raise awareness regarding the um, regarding the widespread research and writing skills crisis. He's evangelized the need for a modern solution to support students and teachers. His team's efforts to build that solution in Scribble have been recognized with awards and support including grants from the National Science Foundation and recognition at events like South by Southwest Edu and ISTE. Most recently, Scribble was awarded the 2019 Classroom Essentials Award for all grades by the Illinois Association of Teachers of English. We want to especially thank Victor and Scribble and Kathy for, for sponsoring tonight's webinar. Feel free to reach out to Victor directly with questions or feedback at victor at scribble.com. Please join us in thanking them when you tweet at Scribble. You can view any of these webinars for free on ISTE Librarians Network site anytime. We'll be taking questions and comments via social media tonight. Please tweet using our hashtag ISTE Lib and we'll do our best to answer. The ISTE Lib team and Victor and Scribble promise to pay attention to the ISTE Lib tag this week for questions and comments anytime. Again, thanks for joining the ISTE Lib community tonight and I'm going to turn it over to Victor. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Nancy Joe. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm going to basically share my screen here, here in a minute and sort of dive right into um, the presentation and then a demo. And then we're going to hand it over to Nancy and Kathy to talk a little bit about how they're actually using Scribble at their schools. Um, and then we've got some time for um, a Q&A at the end as well. So um, let me just uh, share my screen here, and then we can get started right away. Um, should be able to do that right here. And I guess I'll ask for a confirmation from Nancy Joe to see if my screen's actually showing you now. Well, I guess she's seeing herself right now. Hang on a second. <laughs> I am right. seeing myself. <laughs> okay. You should all now see a slide that says a scribble modern platform for close reading, research, and writing. Is that right? Uh, I need somebody to say something. Yes. So I can, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. That's what we see. Sorry. I'm not looking yep. at I, it. So, no I have problem. my microphone That's muted. <laughs> Okay, so um, and Nancy Joe did a great job of kind of giving a really quick intro. And what I wanted to do was talk to you about something that obviously I feel very personally passionate about um, because it's a problem that I, I face in school and even in the workplace. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess fortunately when you start a company, you hope you're, you're not the only crazy person in the world that has that need. And we found that obviously what we've built and what we're working on um, that we feel really passionate, passionately about is felt by a lot of people. Um, and I'm really excited to be doing this, particularly today, because I literally just came off of three days uh, of uh, spending time with uh, this community, specifically in New Jersey, uh, at the NJZL conference for New the New Jersey Association of School Librarians. Um, so uh, let me dive right in. Um, you know, basically, uh, like as I said a few minutes ago, the agenda here is that I'm going to give a quick intro and demo of what Scribble has to offer. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Nancy, Joe, and Kathy to talk a little bit about how they're using Scribble at their respective schools. 
Uh, and then I'm gonna broaden the conversation a little bit out right after that to kind of give you some additional ideas about how you can use Scribble beyond kind of the traditional research paper, which is what I think a lot of people tend to think about um, using us for. Uh, and then of course we'll have questions as well. So um, to talk about um, kind of the problem, if you will, and the background of what we're trying to address, uh, you know, as many of you know, working with teachers and students on a daily basis, um, there's a big sort of research and writing skills crisis. Um, and this has been pretty well documented by various studies that show that a lot of our students that are particularly, you know, coming out of secondary, um, secondary grades, um, they struggle with research skills and they're not ready for college level writing. Now, a lot of people would say that these problems start pretty early. Some would say as early as sort of late elementary. Uh, we tend to focus on it primarily in grades six through 12. Um, however, we've been really pleasantly surprised that we'll have, um, you know, a fair number of teachers um, and instructional coaches and librarians meet us at conferences and say, oh no, you know, don't write us off in elementary. We do some um, early stage research and writing in elementary as well. And so we've got some plans and some thoughts about what we're gonna be doing there. Um, and we'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. Um, the problem that I'm talking about here, as many of you know, you know, kind of um, gets started, if you will, in K-12 and unfortunately continues on into college and even in the workplace. Um, as you can see on this slide, there was a study done by Achieve a couple of years ago where they surveyed college instructors and ask them how they're, you know, how well they feel that students are prepared um, in terms of research and writing when they come, uh, you know, come to college. And as you can see here, the results are frankly uh, kind of disappointing. And recently, we were actually at the NCTE conference, and I, we were kind of pleasantly surprised about, you know, how many uh, professors of English at that conference um, came up to us and sort of said, "Hey, this looks like something that could be interesting to us as well." Um, and so we think that kind of what we are working on um, is actually kind of a broadly applicable problem. Um, and the solution we're building is actually kind of built for that. So what we'll tell from my comments is that we've gone around the country and talked to lots and lots of folks like yourselves, um, including again, just the last three days, I've done that personally with New Jersey um, school librarians. Uh, we've also dissected the workflow. So we've tried to look really, really closely at how this work has always been done historically by students and teachers. And what we've seen, um, which come, probably comes as no surprise to folks on this webinar, is that research and evidence-based writing at the end of the day is a complex project, right? It requires lots of different tasks like you see here on the left-hand side and actually more than just those, um, and a variety of skills associated with completing those, those tasks. And in this day and age, you know, we are all kind of faced with information overload. Um, and I think that certainly applies to students that are actually, you know, trying to put together a research paper or do projects and they're accessing the open web and they're looking at, um, you know, the subscription databases that um, their schools have subscribed to. Um, and then from a teacher's perspective, <clears throat> you know, we've been told many, many times now that if you are the teacher um, that is kind of in charge of a particular research project or paper, um, it's laborious, it's tedious, it's a bit of a beast. And uh, part of it is that this work has historically been done uh, by students offline and at home and over a long period of time. So it's not like all of it's being done right in front of you, you know, in the library or right, right in front of you um, in the classroom if you're a classroom teacher. Uh, and so it's a hard thing to teach and track, uh, which is the last point here. And so to try to address these problems, what we've done is a solution that really tries in one place to give you um, the tools that historically, you know, teachers and students have had to cobble together using three or four different apps, right? So you might have used a standalone citation tool, a standalone PDF annotation tool, a standalone web clipper, uh, maybe an outlining tool. And the downside of that, of course, is that you know, students have to kind of log in and out of multiple apps. Um, it's harder to stay organized um, as you're kind of putting these, this patchwork of, of tools together. Um, and in many places, they're not necessarily all even digital, right? You know, we talk to lots of folks that are saying, oh yes, we're still using physical note cards or we're having kids print out articles and bring them into class so we can look at their research. Um, and so it's a very disjointed workflow and it's harder for students to kind of stay kind of all in one place. Um, with their work. And so what we've done is we've tried to address that by bringing all those tools together under one platform that we call Scribble. Um, and there's various sort of benefits for teachers and educators as well uh, when they're kind of engaged with the Scribble platform. But one of the ones that we really like to focus on is that we're able to take the data and the workflow um, um, that comes out of the student work and able to bring it all together in one place for uh, for teachers and librarians so they can see in a single dashboard where kids are in the process in real time as the work's actually happening. Uh, which is pretty novel and uh, we think can be a real game changer for how you spend your time, frankly, with your students. Um, so what we're building is really the first real kind of one-stop shop for this kind of work, which hasn't really been done before and we're really excited about that. And we're really lucky, I think, that we've, um, you know, what we've built, I think, really resonates with um, a lot of the communities that we present to. Um, having just presented at NJSL, I was really um, blown away by, um, 
you know, the number of people that came to my session, actually, I expected a decent turnout, but the room was packed and I was really, really happy about that. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about um, kind of throughout the demo that I'll do here in a few minutes is that, uh, you know, we're integrated deeply with the Google ecosystem. Uh, and the reason for that is we're a Google for Education partner. So I know that many of the people watching this webinar probably are at schools or districts that have kind of gone Google. Uh, and what that means for you is that if you're using Scribble, um, you get these kinds of benefits. You know, first of all, we do single sign-on with G Suite so that students and teachers and, and librarians don't have to manage sort of separate Scribble passwords. Uh, we have a Chrome extension that makes it really easy to uh, curate, annotate, and cite content when you're doing research. We sync with Google Classroom, which makes it really easy to get your class rosters into Scribble. With a couple of clicks, you can basically bring in your, um, uh, you know, your, your class rosters into Scribble from Google Classroom. And then also, we integrate with Google Docs um, through a Docs add-on, uh, which makes it easy to bring your research into the writing process. Um, there's some other things that we do as well, particularly uh, something that we haven't emphasized very much, but I just learned at the conference that we should be doing more of, um, and that is that we also allow you to integrate with Drive, where you can actually open um, PDFs directly from um, uh, you can directly from your Google Drive using Scribble, and that brings a PDF into Scribble and allows you to annotate it. Um, Victor, We're really good for Chromebooks. Yes. Hey, Victor. Um, I just want to say too to our viewers, we do have the chat open, and so people are asking questions in the chat as we go, and I'm okay. trying to answer them. But um, Victor, if there's something that comes up along the way that I can't answer, I may holler back at you. Yeah, please do that. I'm sorry. I'm looking at the. I'm in a version of PowerPoint here where it doesn't give me kind of like a little window <laughs> on the side. So that's okay. I'm just. I'll, gonna see my slides. I'll pop. I'll pop in if there's something. I'm like, oh, we have a question. <laughs> okay. And I'll be out of PowerPoint in a minute, so I'll actually have my regular screen back, and I should be able to see some of that stuff as well. Um, so bottom line is we're grateful Chromebooks, but at the end of the day, if you're using PCs or Macs, um, you know, that works as well, too. Um, right now, you know, just to be upfront, I think we're much better on kind of a traditional laptop or desktop as opposed to tablets. Um, we are working on that, or I should say that's actually on our roadmap, and so we will actually have that in the future. But right now, if you're looking to sort of try Scribble, and see what it's capable of. Um, I think our best foot forward right now is on those kind of uh, uh, laptops and desktops. Um, just so folks out there who are, um, you know, haven't gone Google, I want to kind of point out that we've also started um, integrating with the Microsoft ecosystem as well. So we do offer a single sign-on with Office 365, and some of the things you're going to see in a minute um, that we do with Google, like the Google Docs add-on, we're going to be replicating in the Microsoft world with an Office 365 Word add-in as well. So, um, you know, we are not. Um, I guess biased in that way. We are happy to work with all kinds of systems and um, and you know happy to work with uh, schools and, and districts even if they're not using Google. Um, but we have done more integrations with Google at this point, which is why we kind of emphasize that. So let me um, get out of PowerPoint here and um, actually get into Chrome and give you uh, an idea of how uh, this works. Um, and let me see if I can. Uh, let's see the chat window. There it is. Okay, I'm not sure I'm seeing the same chat flow that you're seeing. Um, so maybe just interrupt me if you feel like there's something that I should be answering that is really topical to what I'm showing on the screen. Does that sound good? Um, okay. So the way that we often talk about this is um, I'm going to kind of just kind of lead you through a kind of quick workflow, right? So I'm going to kind of to walk you through the steps of you know, a student that is doing research on the web and they're working on a paper about space exploration. Um, so they're going to bring an article um, into Scribble. Uh, and then when we're into the library, which is where everything is stored, there's lots more stuff to show. And so I'll just kind of give you the voiceover as I'm doing the demo here. Um, so let's say I'm writing a paper about space exploration and I come across an article on the web that looks interesting. Um, I oftentimes like to do um, searches about SpaceX because they're, the, they're in the news all the time these days. Right, so let's say I come across an article like this one, um, and it looks really interesting to me. And it's relevant to my to my research and my paper. Um, what I would do is I would actually click on the Scribble Chrome extension that you see up here on the right hand side. Um, and when you do that, it'll actually do two things. First, as you can see down here, it goes from zero percent um, to one hundred percent and turns into a green check mark, which means that this article has now been saved in my Mission to Mars paper project library. Um, and then the second thing that comes up, or happened kind of almost simultaneously, is that we float this toolbar on top of the page with some tabs. And what that means is that the student now has this article with one click saved to their Scribble library in the cloud so that they always have access to it, even if the original ever goes offline. And then they can use the tools that you see here to be able to annotate the article 
um, in a way that makes sense to them. So they can highlight and they can do that in various colors if that means something to them. Um, they can also click on any one of those annotations they've made and there's some different options, one of which is to actually add a comment that's anchored to that uh, anchor text or highlight in the original article. They might say, this is great for one of my arguments in my paper, blah, blah, blah. Um, tools here too, and you know, I won't necessarily go through every one, but the basic idea is that you can annotate in various styles, like being able to underline, change text, color, et cetera. And you can do that in a variety of colors. And then comments as well as I showed you, um, if this happens to be an article that is then shared with somebody, or it sits in what we call a shared scribble library, <clears throat> multiple people can actually view the article at the same time and reply to each other and actually have kind of a discourse in the margin. Now, one of the cool things about the way we've built um, Scribble is that if you go to the second tab here on the side, you'll see that it actually shows you who, if anyone else, is actually looking at the same article at the same time. So we've built what you call presence awareness into the application, kind of like Google Docs, where you can see who else is in the doc at the same time. And what this allows for is real-time concurrent collaboration. So imagine that you're doing a collaborative research project or you're doing a close reading with multiple students in small groups. You can actually have three or four of them, for example, looking at the same article at the same time and comments and replying to each other. And everyone will see each other's comments and replies in real time as they're doing that, which is pretty powerful. Um, we also give you the ability to actually tag um, the article right here in the sidebar, in the sort of tag sidebar that you see. And what we do is we um, allow you to see um, a type ahead suggestion of the different tags that might apply. So I can kind of type them here, and as I'm doing that, I can click enter, and th those tags get applied to this article, which is how things are organized um, in the Scribble system. Uh, there's some other tabs here as well. Uh, for example, you can sort of see which library uh, this is located in. You can see the title, which you can edit, and we capture a copy of the URL that this article originally came from for later. Um, I think one of the most powerful things that we do is that we automatically capture citation information from the article. So what you're seeing here is that we've automatically extracted citation information from the article and pre-filled a bunch of the fields you need for properly formatted citation, which you see up here. And then anything we've missed, we put a kind of a pink border around it so the student knows it's missing information they might need to fill in later. Or, or currently, they can just copy and paste that in right now. Uh, we default to MLA, but we support all the different citation styles out there. Um, and it's pretty easy to kind of switch between those. Um, the last thing here, uh, which is pretty cool, is that we've got this feature called the legend feature. And the point of the legend feature is basically to help you quickly um, essentially apply a markup strategy, if you will. So you might say that everything I highlight pink, for example, is related to argument one. Um, and the student can actually kind of make that designation based on the different styles and colors that they're using. Um, and so if you click on this, you'll see, for example, that argument one here for this highlight um, is, a, is a pink highlight. And you can see that it's, um, you know, it's called argument one. Um, and so that's kind of what we built it for. And a little bit later, I'll show you how you can use this, um, not just for kind of making sense of your annotations when you're um, doing research, but also how you could use this potentially for close reading as well, because you can kind of use a color-coded reading mechanism. Now, um, as I've mentioned, you know, all this stuff is getting saved to your Scribble library. So your highlights, your comments, your citations, et cetera, uh, along with the article are all getting saved to your Scribble library in the cloud. Um, and you can go to our website and log in with your credentials, or you can just click on this little library button in the toolbar because uh, you're already logged into the Scribble Chrome extension, it knows who you are. And when you click on that, it'll bring you into your Scribble library, and it'll show you the library that you're currently working in. <clears throat> in this case, that's your Mission to Mars project library. Um, and if um, you happen to be in the paid version of the product, you actually have the ability to create multiple libraries uh, and make them collaborative. So I'm going to show you that really quickly right now, where there's a list of libraries that this student has access to, or this user has access to. Uh, right now, we're looking at the Mission to Mars uh, project library. But the nice thing about Scribble is that you can actually have <clears throat> multiple libraries. So you might have one for your science fair project, one for your English paper, um, one for your social studies project. And so you can kind of easily create different libraries right here. Um, and if we look at one um, like the one that we're in, uh, in a little more detail by clicking on the gears icon here, you can say kind of what it's about if you happen to be the owner of that library. Uh, and you can also invite collaborators. So I can invite individuals. Or if I happen to be a teacher, I can invite the entire class and create a class library, which could be really great if you wanted to share resources that students ought to be using for that, um, for their research, like what sources they ought to be using. Or you can even use this, uh, for example, in a close reading type of an environment where you can throw a bunch of articles in there and then um, use that as the reading list that the students ought to be working with. Um, and as you can see here, it gets pretty sophisticated if you want it to be. You can actually define not only who has access to it and what kind of permissions they have to it, um, but you can actually sort of uh, 
sort of decide if the library ought to be public or not, and some other kind of capabilities that are on permissions that you're probably used to seeing in places like Google Docs. Um, so anyway, you can have multiple libraries. Let's go back to the one that we were actually looking at. Um, when you're in your library, what you'll notice is that there are multiple articles here that have been added in, in this demo account. Um, and the articles could be web pages. Um, they could be PDFs. Oops. They could be PDFs as well, because we not only annotate and help you curate web pages, but we do that with um, PDFs as well. Um, I can show you that a little bit later as well. But the basic idea is that um, this is the place where all your stuff is stored, web pages, PDFs. Um, we've actually recently added support for books and print sources as well. And whatever it is that you add to your library, it all gets full text index and becomes fully keyword searchable. So you could do a simple um, uh, search, like let's say for Elon Musk. Um, oops, not Elon Musk. <laughs> uh, and we'll go and we'll search the full text of the entire library and we'll show you all the places where <clears throat> that term, that search term that you look for appears in some a snippet of context on the right hand side here, right? So the user experience is very similar and I think pretty intuitive and friendly um, to folks that who are who've used webmail products like Gmail. Um, you can do a simple keyword search and find a needle in a haystack. Uh, if you are somebody that uses labels in Gmail and you're used to organizing things, you can use tags, uh, which is kind of our equivalent to be able to quickly tag things in your library. Um, and as you see here, you can actually just tag and it'll filter the entire library to show you all the articles that have been tagged. All right. So um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some other aspects of the library where there's a lot of cool capabilities um, beyond just looking at your articles. So if you wanted to be able to look at um, you know, all the annotations for a particular article, you don't necessarily have to open it up. You can actually just click on um, this little right icon that I showed you, and it'll show you a preview of the annotations that you've made for that particular article, right? A comment that I made related to a particular text in the article, a highlight that I made, and so forth. Um, and if you want to go a little bit deeper and look at all of your annotations, we actually have an annotations view, um, which you can click on right here and see. So this annotations tab actually lets you look at your library at a deeper level so that you can kind of see all of your notes and highlight across the entire library at a more granular level. And so for a lot of people, the analogy here is that this is a little bit like looking at all your note cards, right? If you're look, used to kind of thinking about um, research and evidence in terms of note cards. Um, and so here what you're seeing is, you know, uh, a highlight that I made on this particular PDF. Um, you might be also seeing, um, you know, kind of a comment that I made. Let's see, a comment that I made, which is really not meaningful very right here, but a comment that I made about this particular text in the original article that we call the anchor text on this particular web page, right? So that's how that looks and works. Um, I'm going to switch over here to the bibliography tab to show you that we also have built in a bibliography editor where you can build and sort of edit your bibliography over time. Um, right now, this bibliography only has one citation in it. Um, and what we've done is taken your sources tab that you see over here and embedded it here on the right-hand side so that you, you have easy access to your articles while you're creating your bibliography. And so you may go through here and say, you know what, um, I'm going to just browse through my library here and see what articles I have and say, you know, I actually may want to include this um, source in my bibliography. So I click on that and you see it flashes green on the left-hand side and just adds that. And so I can do that again, um, maybe with a different citation, and it adds that on the left-hand side. So it's super easy with a couple clicks. You can really quickly and easily build your bibliography. And most of the time, but if for whatever reason you need to switch citation styles midstream, you can do that by choosing from this dropdown. And literally with just a click, you can sort of change the, the, the citation style for the citations in the bibliography. Okay. Um, you can copy this as well if you need to copy and paste this elsewhere, but I'll show you how you can actually get this into a Google Doc a little bit later. Um, let's go over to your outline tab. Um, this basically is an outline editor that we just launched uh, in May, and we did a, did a big update to it in October. And so similarly, this is the workspace, and on the right-hand side, you've got your sources um, as well. And what you can do is kind of build the skeleton of your outline if you wanted. So you can sort of say, hey, let me build, you know, uh, let me put in argument four here. And then you can certainly um, write things in it. If you wanted to build, um, you know, you can sort of, you know, put your own, own thoughts here, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then what's really interesting, I think, is that you can actually go into the different annotations of the different sources you've saved here, look at their annotations, and say, you know what, I actually think I want to bring this uh, pink highlighted evidence into my outline. You can drag and drop it. And depending on where you let it go, it gets kind of added at the right level. So if I'm going to let it go here, it'll get added. And over here on the right-hand side, you can see that we know kind of um, where it came from. Now, if you happen to not 
you want to be in browse mode, you can actually search for things, right? So I can say, hey, let me search. Hey, Victor? Yes. Um, we have a question. Actually, we have a couple of questions. Uh, so I wanted to pause you for just a moment. Um, sure. One of the questions is, uh, are the articles that come up through the Scribble search, are they vetted articles or are they, uh, wh where do those come from? Great question. So um, we are not a content provider, so we don't provide the content. Um, so we don't do any vetting on our own. We're basically just giving you a set of tools to help you work with content that you find elsewhere. So whatever sources you've recommended to students or you know, if you want them to use your um, databases, because we actually are compatible with a bunch of the databases that are subscribed to in schools, um, that's all you know, up to the teacher, the student, et cetera. Uh, we just give you the ability to kind of bring it in and then work with it in a really kind of modern way. And uh, you have another question from Ms. Turbopsk. I'm not sure what this name is. Uh, she, uh, is uh, she says that she met you at CASL CECA conference in Connecticut. Yes. Um, and she's a K through nine librarian, um, but she's asking uh, that you had mentioned that you're working on an elementary platform. Yeah, so it's um, not something we have right now, but we are actually asking folks who are um, interested in what we're doing to uh, basically try us out and then give us feedback so that when we build the Scribble Junior product, which is what I've called it a couple times, um, we've kind of uh, got some input on how to modify the interface that we currently have. Um, I think the Scribble Junior product, when we have it, we may end up having a different name at the end of the day when we launch it, but um, the concept is it's going to be something that's sort of aimed at elementary students um, and teachers, and it'll probably have a more simplified interface than what I'm showing you now. Um, the other thing I should mention, since we're talking about elementary, is that we have been, as I said, pleasantly surprised that we've had a lot of teachers and librarians and instructional coaches come up to us at conferences and say, um, hey, you know, we actually, um, let me turn this off so you can see me talking for a second, so um, that, you know, we do do sort of some research and writing um, in fourth and fifth grade. And so we do find people today, certainly, who will take what I'm showing you now and maybe use bits and pieces of it that are age appropriate for their uses in fourth and fifth grade. When we talk about an elementary version, we're probably talking about something that could be used more broadly down to maybe even, you know, third grade, second grade, et cetera. And that, uh, that, was, a, that was Valerie, by the way, that asked that question. Okay, great. <laughs> was there another or is that it? That's it right now. Okay, great. So let me go back to sharing the screen, and um, I'll just pick up where I left off. Um, I would think I was just showing you, and I think I did it when I was switching over to questions, so let me do it again. So let's say instead of browsing this sort of um, set of sources, you did a search, and you said, you know, I remember highlighting something about Mars, but I can't remember what it is. And very quickly, you get back all your search results, which are all the places where the word Mars appears in some place, you know, in a highlight, or in a comment that you made, or, or even in the anchor text. Um, and so if I you know, go down here and I think, oh, here's something I underlined uh, that was interesting. Um, you can drag and drop that in as well at a different place. Um, and when you do that, you'll see in this case that we've actually updated your bibliography automatically with the source that that underlined text came from. And so part of what we're trying to do is kind of reduce cognitive load on manual information processing, right? So right now, when you do something like a very learning, a very process-oriented learning experience like research and evidence-based writing, there's lots of things to keep track of, right? I Oh, I, I added this thing to my paper. I've got to remember to go make sure that I update my bibliography. Some of that stuff is sort of um, manual information processing. And so what we try to do is sort of offload some of that to software where things kind of get updated and um, synced in the background kind of automatically. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't check everything to make sure that you know it's all right. Certainly you should. Uh, but part of what we're trying to do is really shift students' time away from manual information processing so they can spend that on the more critical thinking aspects of the process, like thinking about the structure of the paper, the validity of the evidence, and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's why you see this, these kinds of things in our system. Um, I'm going to go here to the legend tab. And you may remember that I showed you, um, you know, in the article that you can call up your legend um, in the sidebar to see you know, how you may have wanted to designate certain styles and colors and what they might mean um, to give kind of your, um, when you are in your library, you can actually set your legend in this tab at the library level so that it applies to all articles that are in that library, right? So it's a way to kind of just do it once and then it kind of applies universally. Um, we also have a papers tab here. And this has gone through some changes actually recently as well. Um, but the basic idea is that once you've connected Scribble to your Google Docs account or your Google Drive account, um, you can actually create Google Docs right from within Scribble. Uh, and we will create it in Google Drive, and it'll live there. But we'll also kind of provide a shortcut to it right here so that you have easy access to all the relevant documents that you've created for this particular project. 
Um, and if you were to click on one of these, you'll see that we bring you into a view where the Google Docs um, editor is kind of embedded within Scribble in this Papers tab. And the student can actually actually write the paper here if they want to. Um, and if they want to go into full screen mode to get into a more familiar interface that they're used to in Google Drive, they would just click on this little link on the right-hand side, and it'll pop you out to the normal kind of Google Docs um, viewer that you're used to. Now, the nice thing about being in this um, mode is that you can use our Google Docs add-on, which is one of the things I was going to demo for you. So um, for those that are not fami familiar, Google Docs add-ons um, are things that Basically, you can kind of um, discover and add individually, or you know, your, if, your, if your school or district has gone Google, your Google Apps administrator can actually kind of push Google Docs add-ons out to all your students and teachers, just like they push Chrome extensions out to all of them. But once they're um, in your accounts, they'll appear here. And so in this demo account, I only have Scribble Writer added, but there are lots of other add-ons out there that might be interesting to you that you can add on, and they would appear in this. Um, in this when you load our add-on, like all add-ons in Google Docs, they appear in the bar on the right side. Here um, is that what we've done with our add-on, um, and what you do with your add-on really depends on, frankly, what kind of product you are, or what kind of add-on you're building. So, like, if we were like a math company, you know, what you have in on the side here might be um, like a formula manipulator for math or geometry, something like that. Um, in our case, because we're helping with research and writing, what we've done is that we've basically slimmed down and embedded the uh, Scribble library that you see here. Um, we kind of slimmed this down and embedded it right within our add-on on the right-hand side so that students have easy access to their research uh, over here while they're writing their paper on the left-hand side over here. And so this looks pretty similar to the sidebars that I showed you in the bibliography and the outline tabs in the library. Um, but you know, just to kind of recap how this works, you know, when you're in here, you can kind of browse your library. Um, you can kind of dive into one of the, oh, that's a terrible article because it doesn't have a lot of <laughs> meaningful annotations, but you can dive specifically into a particular article and see its annotations. Um, if you want, uh, you can do a search experience instead as well. So if you sort of say, let me look for all articles where or all annotations where Elon Musk appears, um, I can do that. And the cool thing about this is that when you're writing your paper, if you come across something interesting that you want to bring in, uh, like let's say this pink highlighted text, uh, you can actually click on insert quote here. And it'll go and sort of take that pink highlight in your library, and it'll drop it into the paper and insert an in-text parenthetical citation at the end, and it'll quote it here as well. And you'll also notice that this little area here is spinning. And the reason it's spinning is it's actually kind of looking at your bibliography um, that I showed you before, and it's noticing that you added um, you know, this information in here. And when it finishes, what it's done is it's actually updated your bibliography on the last page of the document like so. right? Um, and so that's part of that kind of intelligence thinking that I was talking about earlier. Now, a um, couple of updates that we've made recently now add your outline to your Google Docs add-on as well. And so you can actually reference that outline whatever you want. And if you happen to be coming into the document for the first time, you can actually insert the entire outline as a numbered list, which is exactly how it looks when you've created it. Or one of the cool things we've done um, for po folks that are kind of Google Docs geeks um, is that we've actually allowed you to insert your outline as a document, as document headings as well. Um, and that's kind of a different look and feel. But the main benefit of that is that Google Docs then automatically picks it up in their um, kind of document um, outline uh, that some of you may have seen before. Um, and then the last thing I'll point out here is that we have the bibliography, which looks just like the bibliography that I showed you previously. What's cool about this is that um, it's all meant to sort of stay in sync. So if you make any changes to your bibliography, you'll notice that this green check mark that was up here turned into a red exclamation mark. And that's because the add-on knows now that your bibliography is no longer in sync with the bibliography in the document on the last page of the document, which I accidentally deleted, actually. But the basic idea is that if you were to um, click on this, it'll go through, and it'll update your bibliography on the last page of the document, and it'll show you that it's just got two citations there now. Right? Hey, Victor. Yeah. We have a couple more questions. Um, Peggy asks, does Scribble provide an introductory tutorials for getting started with research so they can learn about the steps? So we have a couple things that help you get um, up the learning curve, because we know there's a lot of cool things that have been built here. Um, when you first join, and maybe I shouldn't have stopped my sh screen share, because I can show it to you right now. Um, when you first join, um, we have a kind of a getting started tour. kind of help you flip through the different parts of the interface and give you a quick sense of you know, what the different buttons and different things do. Uh, we're in the process of actually 
because we have a lot of changes to the product recently. So we're expecting that we'll have um, the new in-app tours, which is what we call them, done um, uh, for January. And that'll make it really easy for people to understand like what the different tabs do and what the different things in each of the um, different interfaces do. Um, so that's one thing. A second thing is we actually had, and I think we recently just pulled it because we're making updates to it, an option under the help menu that's called uh, Scribble EDU Guides. And it's a set of uh, PDF tutorials, basically, that um, are you know screenshots with captions that sort of cover different topics and say, you know, what does the toolbar do? Or how do I sync with Google Classroom? Those kinds of things. So that's a separate sort of um, tutorial or a set of guides in PDF form that we're currently updating as well that'll be updated for January as well. Um, we also have, for folks that need it, um, an FAQ that you can access from right here at the bottom. Um, and that'll bring you to our FAQ. And again, given all the recent changes, we're in the process of updating that. So we're expecting a lot of these resources are going to be updated for all the new changes we've made um, for your use in January. Uh, we also do webinars, as I think I've done with Kathy and her district um, and other folks. Uh, so if you all need us to do like an, a webinar to kind of introduce this in the way that I'm introducing you to now, or I guess you could just theoretically just share this webinar recording <laughs> with your folks internally, uh, that's another way to kind of get updated as well. Um, I'm going to also just sort of... We did have another question too. Yeah. Um, is there a workspace for the beginning of the research, such as recording research questions and thesis? This question comes from Andrew. Great question. The short answer is not yet, but we've gotten that feedback, and so it's on our list to look at. Um, we've had people say, you know, we've got your five essential questions, or we've got the place where we want the student to kind of work on the thesis statement. So um, we've gotten that as feedback, and so that's kind of on our roadmap, but we don't have a specific place for that very early, early um, step in the process yet. Anything else? No? OK, good. All right, so let me go back. Um, we're just about done with the sort of student side of things. Um, let me see if there's anything else. No, I think that actually does it. Um, I did show you how we kind of annotate PDFs. Uh, I'm going to just take a moment to kind of show you that, because it's kind of cool how it works. And then I'm going to switch over to what teachers get um, using Scribble. So I'm going to fake this a little bit in the interest of time. I'm going to pretend that I happen to come across a PDF while I'm doing research on the web. Um, and when I do that, you'll notice that, obviously, it loads in the default PDF viewer in Chrome, just like you know other browsers. They all have PDF viewers built in now. Um, but what's cool about this is that we uh, are able to bring you bring this PDF into Scribble with one click. So when you're looking at a PDF in Chrome, uh, you can literally click on the Chrome extension that, that I showed you previously for capturing web pages. And when you do that, it brings it over to our cloud-based PDF viewer and annotator. And as you can see here, it went from 0 to 100% pretty quick. Um, how quick that happens might depend, well, does depend, frankly, on the the, the size of the PDF. So something that might be 100 pages will take, take longer, certainly. Uh, but this is a 19-page PDF, and it happened um, in the blink of an eye. And what happens is that it's now in our viewer, which means that you can do pretty much um, everything that you I showed you previously that you can do with web pages. You can go through, and you can annotate. You can add comments. Um, this is great, blah, blah, blah. Um, one of the things that's unique about our PDF viewer is, unlike most PDF viewers, because we're focused on education, we actually have the citation sidebar built into our viewer. Um, our extraction of P citation information right now is way better for our web pages than for PDFs. But the nice thing is at least the information lives with the PDF in our viewer, and you can certainly correct anything that doesn't look right. Um, we also have a thumbnail viewer because it's a PDF viewer. Um, so that's all there. And I uh, just wanted to show you that when you do that, obviously, you know, it gets automatically added to your library. Uh, and if you need to make any changes to it, like changing the, um, the title, you can certainly do that as well. So um, let me switch gears here a little bit and talk um, a little bit about the teacher view and kind of what educators get out of this. Because so far, we've been focusing really, really heavily on the student workflow and you know, annotating, curating, citing, and kind of building your bibliography and outline. Um, students and teachers have a classroom tab. And what I'm going to show you now is kind of like the view from the teacher's perspective. So if I'm a teacher and I come into the classroom tab, um, when you first come in, this is going to be empty. Um, so you're not going to see. Um, any um, any classes, and um, I'm going to try to speed through this a little bit because I feel like I'm eating up a lot of the time that I was hoping to give to Nancy, Joe, and Kathy. But the gist of it is that you can sync with Google Classroom to basically bring your classes really easily into Scribble. Um, you can also create research project and paper assignments. 
Um, and the main difference between those two things is that when you create a research project, students might be curating um, and annotating sources, and then they submit the whole library of content that they've curated and annotated. Um, and when you're doing a research paper assignment, um, they're actually handing in the Google Doc that they've created as well. Now, the nice thing about this is that when you create an assignment, um, there's some sort of mundane fields here, but you can also specify, for example, any citation um, or how many cited sources, how many words in the paper, and you can even recommend what sources they ought to use, right? So that's pretty cool because you can kind of help direct their um, direct their work before they get into it. So what I'm going to do is quickly show you an example of what this looks like for an actual research paper assignment, and then I'm going to shut up for a minute <laughs> and let um, Kathy and uh, Nancy Joe talk about Scribble from their perspective. Um, so here's an example of a research paper in history where the teachers recommended certain sources and has said you need, you need to have five sources in 1,000 words. Um, as the teacher, if I want, at any time, I, I can actually look at the progress um, in the teacher dashboard that I told you about at the very beginning. So I can click on this View Progress link, and we bring you into kind of the analytics dashboard where you can see how many kids have started the research or not, started the paper or not, or met certain goals, like having a certain number of citations or words in the paper, which are the goals that you created when you created the assignment. And we have a lot of teachers that have said in the past that you know, if you assign a paper and Billy hands in a bad paper at the end of the assignment, you don't necessarily know where he went wrong um, because of all the, you know, uh, the fragmented workflow and the things that I talked about earlier. Well, now you can see that if it's three days before the paper's due and five of these students haven't even started the research yet, you kind of know where to focus your time and energy, right? And you kind of know where people are getting stuck. Uh, we also have the information at the individual student level. So we can show you, for example, that Jordan here has collected seven sources. She's met the first goal of having six cited sources in the paper. She's um, on her way to meeting the second goal. Susan here is a rock star. Jeremy, who I like to pick on, has you know, done a lot of writing but hasn't used much cited evidence yet in the paper. And these are all things that are great to know um, early in the process so you can help the kids kind of course correct in case they're getting off track. Um, and the last thing I'll talk about here is that we have actually, um, we can kind of at a very high level bucket the information they're pulling into their work to give you some sense of the credibility and the diversity of sources that they're using. So for example, sources that she cited, um, where are they coming from? Government websites, a Wikipedia article, academic websites, a news article, and so forth. Um, and this is going to be getting kind of more um, detailed over time since we're now compatible with a bunch of databases like EBSCO and Gale and Britannica. We'll be able to show you in the future, you know, are they pulling information in from the, live, from the open web, from databases that you've subscribed to, et cetera. And the last thing I'm going to um, quickly just uh, point out is that when you're the teacher, if you want to be able to review the work, uh, you can do that by clicking on this link, and we bring you to a kind of a, an assessment panel, if you will, uh, or an assessment page where you can see, oh, here's Jordan. Uh, I see she started the assignment. I can jump into her Google Doc, um, and there's not nothing here because it's just a demo account, but I can see her paper and see how she's done. I can also jump into her library and assess everything else, right? Her sources, and then come back and say, hey, let me uh, provide some feedback. Great start. You need five more sources. Click submit feedback. and um, and, and she'll see that comment uh, or that feedback in her, in her account. OK, I've talked for longer than I wanted to, so I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to just reference um, you know, what we wanted to try to do earlier, which is uh, hand this over to Nancy Joe and Kathy to talk a little bit about how they're actually using these tools for research and writing at their uh, respective um, schools. So let me try to stop sharing my screen if I can find that window. And I'll hand it over to Nancy Joe. Um, we have a few questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things, guys, in the chat, or um, uh, right here real quick, and then I'll, when I'm finished, I'll go over the questions so Victor can um, talk about those. Sure. All right, so um, Victor, did you, let's see. Oh, I'm still screen sharing. Sorry, I thought I'd done. I was done with that. Okay, there you go. Okay, let's see if I can share my screen now. Oh, no. <laughs> You're trying to share your screen, right? Yeah, it's not really going. I don't, I don't think it's stuck. Let's see. Oh, no. <laughs> Technical challenges. Technical no. challenges. Okay. Um, well, I don't know if I can. 
Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to click right over here to the questions. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, can you play videos within Scribble if the website you're including incorporates a video? So I think she's referring to like if you have a source with a video, can you play the video? Good question. So um, if right now when you save an article to Scribble, um, it sort of saves like I guess the image of the video, so it doesn't actually play in the saved copy of the article. However. Um, as I showed you before, when you save an article, we capture the original URL. And so you can always jump back to the original URL. It's kind of like having bookmarking baked into our system. Um, you also have the ability to actually save links. So you can actually save a bookmark or a link to the page that that video is on or the actual video, a link to the video itself. So um, it's not sort of to the point where we've integrated video really deeply and well, and that's something that is also on our roadmap. But you do have ways of being able to easily reference and bookmark and get back to the videos that you want to. Um, uh, to include in your research. And we had another question. Uh, did he say that students could do collaborative projects in Scribble or just that they could collaborate with each other on individual projects like through sources and stuff? Right, so the way you can collaborate right now is that you can share articles, you can share libraries, and um, you can concurrently annotate those articles in those libraries. Uh, the assignments that we currently have in the system that I showed you are individual assignments. Um, however, if I remember correctly, a couple weeks ago, we figured out a way to be able to potentially kind of hack a group project short term. Uh, we actually have on our roadmap to be able to kind of do a proper group project um, sometime next semester. So we might even have it for January. We can actually create um, proper group projects, but it's not officially in the system or in the interface yet. And then uh, Valerie asked, can I see their actual work and comment on it? Yeah, so I don't know if you saw, but at the very end, and I rushed through because I wanted to, didn't want to eat up too much of Nancy Joe's time. Um, when you are actually looking at the assignment, you can jump into a student's library where you can see all their work. You can see their annotated articles, their bibliography tab, their outline tab. So yes, you can. That's one of the nice things where you can provide formative feedback as the work is happening, and and do it whenever you have time, as opposed to trying to essentially burn a lot of valuable class time doing the one-on-one -on -one check ins. Um, in class. You can kind of do it whenever you need to because it's all available to you at any time. And then Andrew asked, do you have school or district account plans? So we have school plans, we have district plans. Um, we are actually uh, throwing around uh, a couple of different ideas. Um, one where I was like, I was like, should I bring it up tonight or not? We're actually um, thinking about a library plan, um, which would be sort of aimed specifically at this audience of media specialists and librarians. Uh, that would probably be in the neighborhood of about half the cost of what a school plan would cost and would cover all the um, all the students and librarians, but not necessarily the teachers and wouldn't include the teacher features. So um, I guess keep an eye out for that. We'll probably have an announcement about that. Um, and we may even do a beta launch of it later this month or even in January. We so, have a district. I said we we mine is a district license that our district par purchases for this is our second year, third year. Second year. Second year. So. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, that's an important point. So Kathy kind of represents the what you can do all in with Scribble in the paid version of the product, which is kind of what I try to give you. I try to give you the full view of what's possible. Um, and then I think what Nancy Joe could speak to is at her school, they've been using the free version of the product, which lets you do quite a bit. And I think she could probably speak to it better than me. Um, and maybe that's a good segue for you to do your piece. Um, unfortunately, the, the screen is stuck, <laughs> so I can't share my screen. I don't know what's happening. I'm not even sure how I'm going to stop the broadcast in a few minutes. But um, I will say that with my students, what I do is um, I link Scribble uh, in our Mac and Via, which is where we house, it's the platform we use to house all of our um, databases. And especially with my pre-AP and my AP students, I find that you know, they have to collect resources and information for a lot of different projects and a lot of different classes. And so Scribble is really helpful for them because they can tag it, they can create libraries of resources by class, by project, um, whatever works better for them. Um, with the, with the add-on as well, it's very easy for them to pull in those annotations and those sources into, we use, we're a G Suite for Education District. So our students use um, Google Drive a lot when they're doing research and working on stuff, uh, both slides and docs. And so um, that's a helpful feature um, as well. And then just the fact that they can pull all those, uh, what what they 
have told me they like about it is they can pull in um, URLs from websites, from databases, from all the different places that they're collecting source data, um, basically anything that has a URL, and they can pull that in and have it all in one place uh, that also helps them create a citation. Our We have capstone um, AP seminar and AP research classes, and those students have found it incredibly helpful too because they have to have accurate citations. They can't just rely on a citation generator, um, especially for web sources. Most of our database citations are pretty thorough, but when it comes to web sources, they find it incredibly helpful to be able to go into Scribble and, and save something and annotate it and then pull up the citation on the side uh, in the Scribble toolbar and go in and add in the piece of information that um, it wasn't able to pull directly from the web. So they found those uh, pieces really useful. And it's so easy for them to get an, even a free account because they just click on that login with Google and they can log in with their um, FISD Google account and then they have their Scribble account. So I know that it's been a really helpful resource for a lot of our students. Cool. And you know, Nancy Joe, I was feeling bad that I ate up a lot of your time because I was like, I'm not going to leave her, leave her enough time because I covered too much of the interface. <laughs> but now that um, there's a technical challenge, I'm actually glad that uh, I guess I did that. I, I'm not. I'm not even. I'm not even really sure if you guys can still see me or what's happening because my screen is just completely frozen. <laughs> I can see. You. We can still see you. Okay. <laughs> you well, look fabulous. Well, that's good because I can't see anything. It's my everything is like frozen. I'm scared to like do anything because the videos, the broadcast isn't over. So. <laughs> All right. Um. Well, I'll quickly. I. I know I'm afraid to share my screen. I actually was able to get on Scribble. I didn't think I could. Um, we, as Victor said, we are a, my whole district um, uses middle school and high school. We, um, and we are a Google for Education's uh, district just um, recently. So our kids do the single sign on. It's been really easy this year. And for us in middle school, we're thinking that um, as long as we keep the, the same G Suite for education and we keep Scribble. So by the time my kids get to be freshmen at the high school, no matter what high school they go to in our county, they'll know how to use Scribble. They'll already have a Scribble account. And really for day one for research, um, they should be ready to go, which is going to be great. And um, I think that continuity will be, will be great. Um, it also gives them, let me see. If I can share my screen, I'm a little scared to try and do this. <laughs> Give it a shot. All right. Ooh, yay. All right. I think I'm doing it. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is the screen that we have. Um, for my kids, we create a new library. We, I should say, so we are a... Uh, middle school, we are north of Atlanta in a, a large district called Gwinnett, and um, we are a STEAM middle school. So our students um, also do a PBL project every quarter. So just about every quarter, um, the classes come in um, either in the, usually either in their language, um, their humanities class or in their uh, science class come in the library and we sort of start their research for their next PBL, um, their next their next PBL project. So I always tell my kids, since we have the paid version, we can have as many libraries as we want. And so their regular library should always be sad because they should always be putting their, um, uh, curating their resources and annotations and things like that within each of their um, different libraries. So as you notice, I have, I have quite a few for different grade levels. And I get, usually we walk through, just go ahead, let's set it up, let's do it. First quarter PBL energy. Um, my kids use a lot of um, using the annotations piece. Um, sometimes uh, a lot of their projects are not necessarily paper. They're, they use the research to either build something for their PBL project or maybe they create. Um, today I was working with sixth graders. Their, um, 
They're doing sustainability systems and they are creating infographics. So in that case, they did research uh, like three weeks ago. They've actually built um, a house that they has to have certain things in it to for their sustainability. Um, their their driving question has to do with um, what using things that are going to save uh, the earth. And so they can now go to their annotations page and pull things off of this when they are creating their infographic. Um, a lot of times my kids also do annotated bibliographies. That's been a big thing this year. And so they can go in here, copy this. Um, we do not have the ability to have the add-on right now. We had it last year. It was great um, because of the way our Google, our G Suite for Education is set up. Right now we can't do add-ons, but we're hoping to figure that out. I know Victor and um, Victor's partner, Andy, are really trying to help us figure that out. I think we have a breakthrough today, by the way. So just as a side note, we might be able to fix that soon. Or Because that. <laughs> um, that is one thing we did use a lot last year, especially creating the annotated bibliographies. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this for a minute. Uh oh, can I get back? Okay. Um, the other thing that my kids do, and I don't have an example here, is uh, this year I noticed that the language arts teachers were really doing a lot of annotating of text, um, just as, as they're teaching different skills. And they were always giving them a piece of mimeograph paper, like a paragraph or an article, and they were making copies of it. And I said, you know, you can do a PDF and have them annotate and scribble which a few of the teachers have started doing, I think after the first of the year, we'll have even more. Um, we are piloting for our county this year, digital learning days, and having that is perfect because they don't need to have the highlighters and things like that. Um, I had, I showed some of the teachers how to create the, um, uh, the annotation, kind of the uh, legend, and so they could show the students the legend and then it's all set ready for them to go. Um, a lot of my, I had teachers last year using the classroom feature. Um, I think this year, a lot of them are overwhelmed with, we have a learning management system and now we're going to Google. Some of them are using Google Classroom, some of them aren't. So I think as soon as we kind of get some of our processes in our county streamlined, that more of my teachers would probably use the classroom feature and especially more for that annotating text. They could go right into it and see it. So I also yeah, want to give a plug for, I will say, so last year, our first year, sometimes we, and all of our schools had different ways they were signing on and, and Victor and Andy were great as far as customer service. I mean, I I could, you know, send an email to help at Scribble and usually I'd, I'd have an answer very quickly. So had to plug Thanks. that for you. Thanks, Kathy. We try. We try really hard. Uh, part of the reason we try really hard is we know that um, this is working in education isn't like working in other industries where if a teacher doesn't get an answer for something during a class period and, you know, you kind of get stuck on something. Um, you know, you won't, may not see those kids again, depending on your, if you have a block schedule of a certain kind, you may not see them again for a day or two. So we're, we try really hard. I mean, you know, we're not as perfect as we'd like to be, but we, we try really hard to be really responsive and we'll be complimented on it by other folks as well. So, so thank you. Um, Nancy Joe. I know we need to shut down in a couple of minutes. I just wanted to, um, if you don't mind, tag one thing on to what um, Kathy was saying. Um, I was going to talk about other uses of Scribble and had some slides, but I know we're out of time. I just wanted to say that I think Kathy's last comments actually a great segue into that. Um, she actually said what I was going to talk about, where um, you know I say that we lead with research and writing, uh, and that's a lot of what I showed today. Uh, but we do have people using us just for literacy in, in the sense of um, close reading and text analysis. And the legend feature is one example of how you can do color coded um, reading with with Scribble. Um, the real time concurrent annotation capabilities allow you to do small group text analysis and small groups in real time in class in a way that would have been normally much more clunky. Um, and the fact that you can pull in any article that you want from any source as opposed to being restricted to 
just um, you know what a li traditional literacy app might have given you because that's really what they're focused on in terms of delivering content. We're not a content provider, and so we work with any content out there, and you can use um, any content for research or for for close readings. Um, and then you know if you're all are interested, um, you know we tend to talk about what we do historically in English history, social studies. Um, we've also had people tell us that we're useful in science for things like writing, if you do writing in science, um, but also for research that not, might not be related to writing, right? So for a science fair project, for um, background research for a lab report. Um, and so there's lots of other use cases for us other than just writing the traditional research paper. Uh, and the last one I'll mention is that, that Google actually added us to their media literacy app bundle at ISTE uh, two summers ago because the kind of tools that we build for online research work really well with the kind of content that's at the heart of the fake news discussion. Um, and so you can use um, us for, an, for example, for literacy, and given that this is a um, kind of a, a, you know, a library-oriented audience, um, Nancy Joe, if you give me one minute, I will just kind of quickly show you uh, an example of how you could use us um, for that. Is that okay? Yep. Okay, cool. So let me just um, switch back to what I wanted to show you. So um, one additional use of Scribble is in media literacy. Uh, and the reason for that, again, is that um, you know, we, uh, again, we, not, we don't have a curriculum around media literacy, but fake news is a thing now, unfortunately. Um, and the kind of tools that we build for online research work really well with the kind of content that's at the heart of the fake news discussion, right? Online news articles and blog posts. So the example I um, usually close with is, as many of you know, there's a website out there called allsides.com. Uh, we're not affiliated with them. We don't have any kind of relationship with them, but we think what they do is pretty cool. Um, they look at how a certain story is covered from the right, from the left, and from the center by different news organizations. So in this case, you know, Fox, HuffPo, and USA Today. So you can imagine as the media specialist or as a social studies teacher, um, you know, going and curating those three articles and putting them into a class library or having your students go out and curate those three articles and then actually using our annotation tools to go through and do comparative analysis, right? You might say, we're doing a lesson about media bias and I want you to highlight bias language or I want you to use the commenting functionality to kind of talk about the author's motivation when they're making certain statements. Um, and so that's another example of how you could use us. And so we typically, you know, again, as I said, we lead with, um, you know, the kind of typical use case. But what we've seen is the kind of stuff that we are focused on is the kind of stuff that students have to be really good at um, broadly in the information age, right? They got to master these skills across um, grade levels. Uh, it's required in state and national standards. And at the end of the day, the kind of work that we're trying to get them to be better at is the kind of work they've got to do pretty broadly when they go on to college where they write term papers and even uh, knowledge economy jobs where they're going to be creating you know, research uh, proposals and white papers and presentations. And so we've seen that we're pretty valuable across grades and subjects. Um, and you know, we've talked about that here, certainly with regards to English, social studies, history. Uh, I mentioned science uh, a couple minutes ago. And if you have any of these kinds of things going on in your school or your district, uh, we've been told that we're, we're good for all these different things. And I've mentioned a couple of them just now. Um, and then certainly certain district level initiatives that are really important in certain places, like personalized learning, project-based learning, college and career readiness, um, oops, um, or writing across the curriculum are all things that people have found us valuable for. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and then I'll really shut up, is uh, I think the personalized learning thing is actually really interesting. Um, as many of you know, people have been pushing personalized learning in other areas like literacy and math. Um, and I think it hasn't gotten the love and the attention that it deserves in the realm of research and writing. And part of the reason is that if you don't have data, it's hard to individualize instruction. And part of what we've tried to do with the analytics that we sh I showed you during the demo is really try to give teachers and, and media specialists visibility into what they've told us has historically been a black box when it comes to tracking students' research and writing process. And so by doing that, we're really hoping that we can kind of empower you all um, and the teachers you work with to be able to provide a more personalized learning approach to research and writing. Um, Wait, and with that... Have one more question, Victor. Yes. Um, if a student wants to use Scribble independently without uh, their school or their teacher, they just want to sign up for it, um, what would you recommend? The free edu plan uh, or the pro plan at $35 a year? So um, uh, what, you're, what that person uh, who asked the question is referring to is that on our website, there's a plans tab. And the plans tab actually will tell you kind of what's free versus what's paid. Um, so if you all want to sort of check that out in detail, um, you just go to scribble.com and, oh, I stopped sharing my screen. Um, scribble.com and you will be able to see, um, let me just show you where it is. Um, the plans tab will kind of give you a breakdown. And so um, there's sort of the basic version that's for average internet consumer user that's free. There's the EDU plan that's free for um, education in K-12. 
and there's the EDU Pro plan, which has a lot more features and capabilities. And um, you can just kind of look at the list to understand what's there. Um, and this pricing here is really meant for an individual subscription for like a high school, uh, um, like a high school student parent that's buying for their student or for a college student. Um, you know, whether they should do one or the other, obviously, is up to them based on what they need. Um, you know, we the the free plan that Nancy Joe is using with her students obviously does a lot and enough to be valuable to her. Obviously, you get a lot more in the paid plan because there's a lot more capabilities there. And then, if you're looking at this, um, since we're talking about pricing at the school or the district level, you get a lot more, where the price per head drops significantly. Um, certainly, under ten dollars a, a head, and depending on kind of how big you are, it can drop all the way down to a dollar student um, or even less. Because I think. Uh, if you're a ginormous district, the volume pricing can really be beneficial. Uh, but you can kind of just, just, just check this out here. And what I did want to say is that if you want to learn anything more about pricing or features, or you've got questions, since we're out of time now, um, I was going to just flash this up there so that you can feel free to email me at victor at scribble.com um, or contact us at scribble.com slash learn hyphen more. And that'll basically submit some information to us and we'll follow up with you um, if you're interested in sort of looking at this uh, for a pilot or for a purchase at some point in the future. Um, and we're happy to hear you even if you just want to use the free product. We have put a lot of our own blood, sweat, and tears into building this, and we're really passionate about it, and we just want people to use it. And from a personal perspective, I just want to, um, frankly, push the envelope where, you know, 10 years from now, five years from now, I want people to say, wow, I can't believe we used to do that work that way, um, in the same way that we all look back now and say, I can't believe people used to write papers on typewriters. Um, we kind of want to change the nature of the, of the way this work is done forever and make it much more efficient and, frankly, insightful um, in a way that historically hasn't been possible. So You and Andy have really put together a great product. And, um, you know, like I said, I have a lot of students that benefit from it. And I was talking to my principal today about it and about <laughs> possibly, you know, getting this campus wide. So we'll, you know, so uh, we'll be in touch. But <laughs> this webinar, great. I think, will be a great, a great resource for people that are, what is it about? What can it do? How can it help my students and teachers? Kathy, did you want to say anything else? Nope. Just, um, you know, I, I've i been an advocate for Scribble. I piloted it three, almost three years ago now, I think, two years ago. And we've been using it. And I think it's worked out really well. And I think uh, for us, the continuity is going to be great. And like I said, Victor and Andy are uh, great resources also. So if you have any questions, they're very quick to answer them. And, and also, I think they also take input. They've taken a lot of input from our teachers and our, our media specialists about what we, you know, what we need in, and I think you guys have really taken a lot of our suggestions to heart and each update, so. We do. We take it really seriously. We implement that, and people see it in the product. So, and we're happy to have it. We love it. So, you can also tell us what you don't like. We we actively ask for that. Um, we tell have. Us, yeah. <laughs> tell us. Tell us where the cracks are, and you know, we'll we'll fix it. Well, and um, we're probably going to have a lot. We had, I think, over eighty people sign up for this uh, webinar and get the link. So, I feel like a lot of people are going to watch this later on their own time. So. Um, anybody that's watching this after the fact, we just want to say um, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for joining us in the future. And if you have any questions for Victor, just reach out to him, victor at scribble.com. And um, he'll be happy to um, get with you about any any questions or anything that you have. So, all right. Well, we appreciate all of you joining us tonight for this webinar. And thank you, Kathy, for helping me co-host and uh, talking about the wonderfulness of Scribble. And thank you for Victor for being here. And uh, we're going to tell everybody good night. Good night. Good night.